the international nor notoriety in the skeptic community with his award-winning weekly show, The Geologic Podcast. He really brilliantly serves up the news of the week through sketches, music, skeptical free-thinking commentary, and with a bit of help from a cast of extraordinary characters straight out of his fertile imagination. It, it does come out of your imagination, correct? Okay. <laughs> A multi-instrumentalist, singer, songwriter, producer, composer, heliocentrist. He has written and produced six independent CDs, performed for President Clinton, shared the stage with Elton John, and has traveled across the country as both a drummer for the nationally recognized Philadelphia Funk Authority and as de facto president for life of the Geologic Orchestra. You know what? Uh, you can read the rest of this in the pamphlet. The, uh, Something I want to share is my path to, to atheism has been through skepticism. And part of my path through skepticism has been to the Geologic Podcast and what George has done. Uh, how many are, are you familiar with the uh, Skeptic's Guide to the Universe podcast? A good many of you. Uh, their mention of George one time uh, led me to his podcast and his podcast helped me along that journey from skepticism and learned I learned to apply it to atheism so uh, it's it's a, a great honor and privilege tonight to have George here for us all okay so without further ado George Rob thank you so much yes the big closing act that's right we even removed the tables for your safety because there's gonna be fireballs and tigers and Trucks and all kinds of stuff. Uh, yeah, can you hear the guitar? Is that cool? Yes, yes. Lovely, lovely. Pennsylvania atheists. My gosh, I rarely perform as a solo artist in Pennsylvania. It's always New York or Vegas or New Zealand or far away from places like Pennsylvania. I think it's the Amish influence. I think is what it is. So yeah, um, <laughs> we have quite a lobby. The Amish lobby. You've ever dealt with a lobby, my goodness. Uh, let's just do this one first here. This was at the moon, I think. When you wish upon a star makes no difference. For my next song, I'd like to do, uh, <laughs> this is about being the quiet person at the party. <clears throat> All of the people who would rather be by themselves aren't inherently unhappy. I think I am the best But let me get a few things off of my chest Because I stand alone with what you call a frown Does not mean I'm stuck off in anything I'm stuck down I know you know you think I think I am the shit But the truth could not be much further from it I'd rather have you wonder what I'm all about and open up my mouth and remove any doubts Don't you assume you really know me Don't you assume I'm sad and lonely Don't wonder what I'm not revealing Looks can be concealing after all I know you know you think I think I'm where it's at But don't forget I see myself as bald and fat I promise you there is some more than what you see But your assumptions tend to make an ass of just me Don't you assume you really know me Don't you assume I'm sad and lonely Don't look for answers on the ceiling Looks can be concealing after all of the people Who would rather be by themselves aren't inherently unhappy so don't pile up your assumptions, you be the life of the party, and I'll be the party of my life. I'll be the party of my life. You can be the life of life, will party hard, you the party of my life. I know you know you think, I think my stank don't stink. I'm sorry Mr. Gladwell, I'm more blank than blink. At first, of course, is tend to become just desserts. I hope you'll stick around for seconds and maybe thirds. For seconds and maybe thirds. For seconds and maybe thirds. Don't you assume you really know me? 
Don't you assume I'm Savalay? You might find my thick skin appealing. Looks can't be concealing after all. I said, looks can be concealing after all. Looks can be concealing after all of the people who would rather be by themselves aren't inherently unhappy. No, we're not. So I come from uh, Bethlehem, Pennsylvania, which is just up the roads a ways. Yes, the Christmas city, as we call it. We actually have a hotel in Bethlehem called the Hotel Bethlehem. And I haven't got the courage yet, but one Christmas Eve, I'm going to go there and complain that there's no room. <laughs> I haven't got the balls to do it yet, but one day, yeah, yeah, you know, what do you mean there's no room? Um, Bethlehem is in the Lehigh Valley. The Lehigh Valley is known for a number of things, but one thing it's known for uh, in, in this particular circle is uh, Lehigh Valley, uh, ha uh, Lehigh University, excuse me, Lehigh University is in the Lehigh Valley. And there's one particular professor at Lehigh uh, by the name of Michael Baby. B E S. Boo hoo. Um, exactly. Um, Michael, Michael B E Baby. Uh, he's a guy who wrote a book called uh, Darwin's uh, Black Box. And in essence, <clears throat> Uh, he sort of says that, uh, that you know, thing, life is so complex that someone obviously must have designed it. That's the basic thing, you know, the, the flagellum on, uh, on some, some tiny, tiny microorganism is way too complex. And because I can't think of how it would be done, obviously God must have done it. So <clears throat> for years I've been waiting to bump into Michael Beatty at some point somewhere in Bethlehem because I know he's there, he has tenure. At Lehigh, and uh, I keep waiting to bump into him. I know what he looks like and the whole thing. And so, of course, one day I'm, I'm driving from. I feel like I'm having a colonoscopy. That's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's me the doctor's appointment. You know. If I cough indiscriminately, you'll know why. Um, so I'm driving. I'm driving to a gig one day, and I get cut off by a car um, uh, with a, a coexist and a Jesus saves bumper sticker on the back of it. Cuts me off. Just like pulls right in front of me and cuts me off. So of course I want to see who is driving this car with the coexist and the bumper sticker on the back. And I pull up next to it, and in the passenger seat, it's Michael Beatty, Michael Beatty, Michael Boo Boo is right there. So I'm driving, he's in the passenger seat, his wife, girlfriend, whatever, is driving the car, and it's like, what do you, what do, you do? You gotta do something, it's like two different opportunities. So he's like, he's right there, and I can't run him off the road, because that just wouldn't be cool. And I can't drive him off the bridge or anything. So I, he's right, you know, like right there. I'm thinking. So I roll the window down. And I don't want to be, I don't want to, I don't want to confirm any kind of biases that he might have against people that are critical of his quote unquote scientific thinking. So I don't know what to do. I don't want to yell something indiscriminate or give a gesture, maybe, you know, that has to do with, I don't know, some kind of, you know, aviation and whatever. I, I don't want to. I don't want to. You know, do anything like that. So I just. I don't know what to do. But it's too good an opportunity. I'm coming to the light. And I know that. Like he's gonna go one way. I'm gonna go that way. It's too good. So I look out the window and I just. I said, boo, <laughs> boo, boo, boo. And it felt so awesome. <laughs> and he looked at me like, Ooh, okay, sorry, whatever. So that was. That's my. That's my. <laughs> My Michael Bay, I've never seen him again. So maybe he's avoiding me, I'm not sure. What's that? That's nice, yeah, too, sure. He doesn't believe in great coupon. It's, yeah. Intelligent cooking, that's what he believes in. Uh, I'm going to do a little uh, sort of an atheist gospel song or a gospel atheist song. That's rather appropriate. Let me see if I can open this up and I tell everybody. All right, we'll wait. <laughs> Can you hear the guitar okay? Everything's all right? The levels are good. Wonderful. I really appreciate you guys hanging out until the very, very bitter end. It's been a long weekend, so I appreciate it. All right. As sure as these star-bellied sneeches butter the underside of their toes, all things being equal, the simplest answers worth most. Don't believe in Vishnu, Buddha, Ron Popeil, or the Holy Ghost. Just consider these words, and that ship of life you're sailing on might not smash into the coast. Watching every channel, all that I do is see. Oceans of gullible conformity. Oh, I've had enough of all the smiles and all the teeth and all the knots. And I've had my fill of promises from magic rays to painless perfect pots. Watching every image that flashes before me. 
can't believe the level of spirituality. Oh, I've had enough of the geeks who claim to have found the way. I hope that guy watching will just take one second and consider what I have got to say. When I say, think for yourself, little man. trying to sell to you, you should be buying. A thing for yourself, little girl. Don't tell you how to run your world, cause everyone's the same, choking by that nervous hurl. And if they tell you they ain't, well they're just lying, yeah, they're just lying. To read about the no-fault guarantee And to see that these results not typical And this offers more than any state was spelled than an E Watch an iron body place bet after amazing bet I wonder if they realize their misplaced press on debt Oh, but they don't want to hear about odds or statistic A or statistic B. Cause they got a brother who's got a friend who's got a mailman who had a cousin who said, hey, this stuff always works for me. That's why I say, well, think for yourselves, little folks. Check one, two, is this thing on? Hey, these are the jokes. Then beware of the dudes who don't like jabs and pokes. Can't laugh at yourself, you just end up crying. Well, think for yourself, little friend. Is it you that they like, or is it the money you spend? Beware of the dudes who will sooner break than bend. And to question anything at all, it's just like dying. Yeah, to them it's just like dying. Of the offers that are so damn tremulous. And I can't conceive the cash of creeps and creepers who continue to be so uncannily credulous. That's why I say, think for yourselves, everyone. Don't believe what is said, put your stock in what's done. Insist on all the facts, and then add up your own song. Or else the punch you receive won't be Hawaiian. Well, think for yourselves, one and all. Don't jump to conclusions. Don't beat up Peter and Capistic Paul. Don't fall for anything, yeah. Please don't drop the ball. Just be sure to do your who, what, where, when, and why. -in. Just be sure to do your who, what, where, when, and why. -in. Just be sure to do your who, what, where, when, and why. -in. Yeah. Geology in it whatsoever, or maybe one percent geology. Nah. <laughs> yeah, sorry. No, I think I tuned in first. I know, I know. That's how I get you. That's how I get you. I have that. I have a very keen sense for fooling geologists, and then you just you can't leave once you're in. That's it. Yes, that's my marketing strategy. I'm going to try to attract geologists. Yeah, that'll work great. And someday I'll play in Harrisburg. <laughs> The plan has come to fruition, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I actually have gotten emails from, from, there was one particular geologist who sent me, who reviewed me somewhere. And again, it's just, it's, it's silly skit, sketches and talking about my life as a, as a drummer, professional drummer, and 
and conferences like this and hosting TAM and there's silliness and it's just an hour of silliness. So someone wrote this review, it's like, I'm a geologist and I tuned in and I said the first hour and it was, there was no geology, there was no geology whatsoever. So I tuned in again for a second hour, I listened to the second hour and there wasn't a stitch of geology, he's playing music, he's telling stories, I listened for a third hour and there was like, how many hours is it going to take for you to realize that my name is George Geo Logic. I, exactly, that's, yeah, it's like a, a shitty pun, I'm sorry, but that was, you know, that's what we went with. So, uh, so they were very, very angry and very convenient. That was cool. Um, here's a, here's a song. Uh, it's, it's, I don't have any children, um, but my sister has uh, uh, two kids, so my niece and nephew, and I have other other cousins that have children. So I'm sort of surrounded by a block of kids that are between. They're all born within two years of each other. So we've seen the seven kids kind of go through all these changes, and it's neat to watch sort of the the topics that were brought up today when you're dealing with kids, like you know. When a kid first learns about Jesus, if they're not being necessarily raised religiously, you know, my, my nephew came to me and said, "What's the, he was nine? He's like, what's the deal with the Jesus thing? What's what's going on? Like, how? What is the what what?" And just sort of say, "Well, some people believe in this, and some people don't." And, and it's really cool to see the wheels kind of spinning in his head, and to equate Santa Claus with you know Moses is just awesome. You know, it's really cool. It's like, yeah, they're both equally the same. It's basically about costumes and beards. That's basically what it comes down to. Um, but I ended up writing a song uh, for him and for his sister, uh, so my, my, my niece as well. Um, and this sort of talks about uh, what things are different and what things are the same. When I was your age, phone was tied to the wall with a kinky twisty three and a half foot cord. It's hard to believe, but it had a ring that could not be turned off or ignored. You couldn't choose the sound of the ring. It was just the sound we called the phone. We never heard of a ringtone. When I was your age, our video games looked nothing like the illustration on the box. All of the graphics consisted of nothing more than simple lines and dots. Missiles were just a few pixels, and the jungle swinging guy was a stick figure. Nothing bigger. When I was your age. When I was your age. This stuff called film, you would stick in a camera before you took a shot, and then you had to wait like a month until you could tell what pictures you got. You would hand the film to a guy in a parking lot who lived in a booth. No shit, it's the truth. When I was your age, if you wanted a movie, you couldn't rent the movie, you just had to wait and see. to wait and see, and once you were watching, you couldn't stop or pause, or even try to rewind, but hey, we didn't mind, when I was your age, when I was your age, you see me as a grown-up, singing from the stage. I bet you can't believe I was ever your age. I was your age. When I was your age, I liked watching Star Wars, but I hear you like Star Wars more than me. I wanted to be Indiana Jones, and Dr. Jones is who you aspire to be. And I loved playing with Legos, and Legos are what you currently build and rearrange. Yes, some things never change. When I was your age, I didn't like doing homework, but when it was finished, it always felt real good. I didn't like brushing my teeth, but I brushed my teeth because Bert and Ernie said that I should. I didn't like listening to Mom, though I knew deep inside it was the right thing to do. And hey, so do you. You know what's true. And before you can say boo, be my age too.
let's see. Um, I recently released an album called Trebuchet, which is I have available if you'd like to buy a copy. Take it home. That song is on there. Um, it's uh, 17 songs on there. I think something like that. So it's a bunch of music. It's, it's a lot of fun stuff. I'll, I'll have it up front if you if you're interested. Uh, you can also just tune into geologicpodcast.com and uh, keep up with what's happening in my life, or just complain about the lack of geology. Either way, uh, <laughs> this is a this is a this is a happy song. This next one. This is perhaps my happiest song actually. Uh, it wonders about our place in the universe. Wonders about uh, why we're here, what we can do while we're here, and. Um, you know, positive stuff. This is called the uh, Everything Alive Will Die Someday. <laughs>
Um, I was very, 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 very fortunate and lucky enough to uh, be asked to travel down to Australia for uh, the amazing meeting Australia, which happened two years ago. I don't know if you're familiar with uh, James Randi, his organization, um, uh, JRF, the James Randi Educational Foundation. They have a, a meeting of skeptics and skepticism every year in Las Vegas, and they did one in uh, Australia a couple of years ago, and they asked me to come down for that. It was an unbelievably humbling and amazing time. Um, you always get caught using the word amazing when you talk about the amazing meeting, and you feel like a schmuck for doing it, but you have to because there's no other word for it. It's just such, just such great minds that uh, get, to, get to hang out. Um, and I, I thought, while I was on a tour bus up in the northern tropics, Cairns, there's a city called Cairns, and their tropics are in the north because it's on the bottom of the planet, so everything's reversed. So you head north to get to the jungle, which is weird, but awesome. <laughs> and the fact that like kangaroos serve you breakfast, I mean, it's just awesome. Um, <laughs> so I'm in the north, and I hear this song come on the tour bus radio that I've known since it came out. It was a song by Sting. Uh, called All This Time. I've, I've known, I've been, a, I've been a police fan, a Sting fan forever. And I knew this song, I performed this song in concert uh, with a cover band that I had years and years ago. And it wasn't until I was on this bus on the other side of the planet that it registered that this is a complete atheist song. I don't know if you're familiar with it or not, but it's, it's this beautiful example of how sometimes you can sneak in your message in the coolest way. It sort of relates to what was just being spoken about, but not, not necessarily being a dick or not being confrontational, but being able to kind of put in this message. I had known this song for 20 years, literally, until it finally registered. That's a, that's a reflection more on my own lack of intelligence than anything else that stings poor writing, but it's a it, it's just incredible the way it worked out. I, I just wanted to do it real quick, because it's just, you listen to it, it's about Sting's father dying, and he's being visited by priests, and the priests are trying to arrange the funeral, and Sting basically wants to just bury his dad at sea, because he knows his dad was an atheist and he doesn't believe in any of this stuff. So he pictures his father laughing at the whole scene. It's so well done and it just totally sneaks in. But I thought it'd be fun to do it. And it's like, you know, it was a, a, a chart-topping hit. We played it on Saturday Night Live. And the word atheist is nowhere in there, but yeah, it got on TV. It's pretty cool. Looked out across the river today Saw sitting in the fog old church tower where the seagulls played. Saw the sad, shy horses walking home in the sodium lights. Two priests and a fairy October geese on a cold winter's night. All this time, the river flowed endlessly. Garrison Town. 
stealing the title of one of his books and writing a song around it, thinking that I would make this incredible impression on Mr. Hitchens, and we would just be best buds after that. <laughs> and of course, he couldn't make it to the damn convention. He had to cancel last minute. Uh, he had a, a, a scotch and cigarette conference to go to or something. I don't know. He had to go to something. Um, and then, of course, he died. So, uh, yeah. But, um, but I ended up writing this song, uh, and it's called God Is Not Great, and that's this. Position 
our belief system or our semblance or our, our organization of the facts before us tends to get a little bit difficult. Uh, I had a, a boxer, a dog, uh, who was, I never had a pet before, and he was my first dog I ever had, his name was Oscar. And he was just awesome. I don't know if you're familiar with the boxer breed, but they are beautiful animals, very, very loving, very, very fun. I had him for eight and a half years, and he got to the point where he got cancer, and, and we had to say goodbye to Oscar. It was really, really difficult. And it was all the more difficult because I didn't want to succumb to that thing of imagining him in some puppy heaven somewhere. You know, puppy heaven where the, the, the squirrels run really slowly. <laughs> it was very easy to picture that. It was very easy to think of that, that he's in a better place. He has crossed the Rainbow Bridge, if you're familiar at all with uh, some dog owners who talk about the Rainbow Bridge. You get tons and tons of emails that your boy has crossed the Rainbow Bridge and he's waiting for you. It was almost like, what do you mean he's waiting for me? He's going to sit there now until I die? No, I got to wait for me to die before he can, you know, like do anything? It just didn't make any sense. Or is there some simulacrum of me playing with him now? Like, what's the deal? Does he wonder where I am? Does he think, hey, wait a minute, like he's gone? Or it didn't make sense, all of this, all of this afterlife stuff, but it didn't make missing him any easier. And I thought, damn it, this is my, this is my foxhole moment. I will never, fortunately enough, We'll see how the election goes, but I think I'll never have to be in a foxhole. Um, so this is as close I'll ever come to that moment where like, your, beliefs, your beliefs actually count for something. And it's very simple and easy to imagine him running around in some beautiful field. But I thought, no, damn it, he's gone. He's gone, he's done. And the only sort of solace that I managed to pull out of it was the fact that when the chemicals stopped flowing in his brain, he didn't have to worry about me. He didn't have to miss me. He didn't have to concern himself with anything because he was done and was gone. It was my job to miss him, which is what I wanted. I wanted it to be on my shoulders. I wanted it to be my burden. I wanted that there to be a hole in my heart to remind me how valuable he was. And it took a while, but I ended up writing this, this, this song, and it's, uh, it's sort of an atheist song. It's called, uh, it's called Small Comfort. <laughs> I'm glad I get to miss 
you, but that you can never miss me. Thinking you'll wake up and see us is your eternity. It's a small comfort. I miss you. I miss you. I love you. fighting the tide sometimes, but, but if you look at where we were 10 years ago, eight years ago, 12 years ago, it's pretty cool, it's pretty cool. So uh, um, I wanted to find, and then a fun one, uh, this is about nerds falling in love. <laughs> this is called uh, Never Knew. <laughs> Thank you so much for hanging out. We'll see you next time. All right.